I'm happy to be with you today, and I want to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I'm going to go back five years. In fact, five years to the day. We preached this same sermon. I hope it'll be a blessing today. It was a blessing to me just reviewing it and thinking, you know, I think the Lord would have us go back to that. Acts chapter 10. And let's read verses 9 through 14. Acts 10, verses 9 through 14. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened. And a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I want to preach to you a sermon today I call Peter the Not-So Apostle. The Not-So Apostle. A few years ago, I picked up a book called Selecting the Pope about papal elections written by a Catholic author named Greg Tobin. And in this book, Mr. Tobin, who dedicates his life to writing about Roman Catholicism and the inner workings of the Vatican, and his church, he offers many of the titles that are given to a newly elected Catholic Pope. Uh, the Pope is called the Bishop of Rome. He's called, maybe that's the most well-known title. He's called the successor of the Chief of the Apostles. That, of course, in their thinking, would be Simon Peter. Interestingly, though, in Mr. Tobin's book, page 12, he says, quote, there is little to no direct evidence of either Peter or Paul in Rome, let alone their activities there. He goes on and he says, by the late 4th century, that would be the 300s, 380, 390 AD, a tradition had developed that Peter resided in Rome for 25 years, but there is no historical verification of this assertion. And he's a professor at some uh, Catholic seminary back east. But to call the Pope the successor of Peter, uh, the Bishop of Rome, just because Peter once was, to that you and I would say, not so, Lord. The Pope is also called the Vicar of Jesus Christ. The, the Latin word vicarius means a representative of and it's been shortened to vicar. Sometimes even in England, they'll refer to their local clergyman as the vicar, the local vicar, meaning their minister or their reverend at their church, even in the Church of England. Uh, in English, we have the word vice, like vice chairman, vice president. And it's the idea that when the president, in, say in the United States government, is outside of the US territory, he's in another country, the vice president is in charge of any domestic matters that may come up. And uh, the Catholic thinking is that since Jesus isn't on the earth now as he once was, he's left the Pope in charge as his vicar. So the Pope is in charge of any spiritual matters that people have that come up here in the world. Not so, Lord. Amen. He's called the Pontiff of the Universal Church. He's called the Patriarch of the West, the Primate of Italy. That's because they're always monkeying around, I suppose. <laughs> He's called the Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Province. That's a mouthful. He's called, he called the Sovereign of the Vatican City State, the Servant of the Servants of God. Pope John Paul II wrote back in 1996, The Shepherd of the Lord's whole flock is the Bishop of the Church of Rome, meaning himself where the blessed Apostle Peter offered to Christ the supreme witness of martyrdom by the shedding of his blood. Because of its great preeminence, that is the city of Rome, 
every church must agree. Well, the Pope should have read Mr. Tobin's, lived long enough to read Mr. Tobin's book. He said there is no historical evidence that Peter or Paul were ever in Rome. There's no scriptural evidence of it either, which is what we've been arguing for the last 1600 years. An earlier Pope, Pope Innocent III, you know how you know, that? You, do you know the fact that this guy called himself innocent means he wasn't. When a guy had, uh, changes his name to innocent, you just know you better believe the opposite. Innocent III died 1216 AD. He stated that he was, quote, the vicar of Christ, the successor of Peter, the anointed of the Lord, the God of Pharaoh, that's using the imagery of Exodus chapter 7, God speaking to Moses, the God of Pharaoh, set midway between God and man. Didn't the Bible say for there is one mediator between God and man, um, and men, the man Christ Jesus? Below God, but above man. Less than God, but more than man. Judging all other men, but himself judged by none. He also wrote that book, Humility, and How I Attained It. <laughs> the legacy of Simon Peter has sure come a long way from the, the fisherman who said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a wicked, for I am a sinful man, Luke chapter 5. And Simon, uh, um, or, or Peter and John, said to the man outside the beautiful gate, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There in Acts 3, verse 6. Two things no pope has ever said to anybody. No pope has ever said, silver and gold have I none. And no pope has ever been able to say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk to a crippled man. But to the suggestion of Peter becoming the pope, you and I would say, not so, Lord. Peter's life during the Lord's ministry makes him the not-so apostle for other reasons, which we'll go to. And we'll come back to Acts chapter 10 later. But first, let's, let me call your attention to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And Matthew 16, notice there verses 21 and 22. I'll give you a few seconds. Matthew 16, verses 21 and 22. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. First, let me say this, Simon Peter said no to the cross. He said no to the cross. It's natural to want to protect someone you love who's in danger of harm. But something or someone more sinister was at work behind Simon Peter at that moment and tried to keep the Lord Jesus from going to Mount Calvary. Verse 23, there in that chapter, says, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. When someone is more concerned with their own physical welfare or the physical welfare of someone else, and that's all they can see. They can't think or see beyond the physical and they're not mindful of the fact that God may be doing something in the unseen realm. And all they can think of is the physical comforts to themselves or to someone they care about. That person uh, is getting ready to do the work of Satan. That person is getting ready to cooperate with Satan uh, or yield themselves to Satan. If he's not manipulating them uh, yet, they're making themselves available. The Lord asked Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschew evil? 
and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Job 2, verses 3 to 5. Then it says, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his head. And from head to toe, he was covered with sore boils. And all, all Job's wife could see was the the sores all over his body and the agony, the misery that he was going through and had no, and neither one of them had any idea that God was doing something behind the scenes. God was trying to work in the life of Job through these difficulties, through these problems. But his wife certainly couldn't see it. And she says in Job 2 verse 9, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The exact words that came out of the mouth of Satan came out of the mouth of Job's wife, and she didn't realize it. She had no idea that she was speaking for Satan at that moment. And so was Simon Peter when he tried to keep Christ from going to Calvary. When Simon Peter said, not so to the cross, he had Satan speaking through him. And uh, Peter said, not so to the cross. Secondly, let me say, let me have you go to Matthew 26, just forward a little bit, Matthew chapter 26, and verses 31 to 34, if you're writing these down, Matthew 26, verses 31 through 34. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And of course, that's exactly what happened as you read the four Gospels and compare, compare one with the other. Secondly, let me say Peter said no, or not so, to conviction. He said not so to conviction. It's easy to make great and bold uh, promises to the Lord. It makes us sound good, makes us feel good, might even make you look good in the eyes of other people. But when problems arise, keeping your word becomes a different story. We cave in too easily. When Peter told Christ he would never be offended because of, uh, because of him, Nobody was pressuring him at that moment. Nobody was putting him on the spot. He could say that with great confidence at the time. But as soon as Christ was arrested and uh, all the disciples ran off different directions, a couple of young maidens later that evening, servant girls, were able to get Peter to deny he even knew Jesus Christ. I recognize you. You know, you're one of his disciples. Another one said, um, you're one of Jesus' followers. I can tell by your accent. That's what it came down to. He's denied he even knew the Lord Jesus Christ before that night was over. And that's when the Bible says the, the cock crew and then Peter went out and wept bitterly. I mean, Christ's words were fulfilled right there and Peter couldn't miss it. As soon as he heard the cock or the rooster crowing that next morning, the words that Christ had spoken to him rang true. He knew exactly what he had just been guilty of. And um, the fear himself, of himself not being arrested, not being taken off and, and maybe persecuted or crucified with Lord Jesus, that caused him great shame and embarrassment. Has that ever happened to anyone here? For example, you're on your way to work. Before you even left the house, you've spent time reading your Bible. You've spent time in prayer. You've spent time thanking God. You've spent time confessing your sins to God. You're in good fellowship with the Lord. Everything's been laid before Him, God, and, and you're ready to face the day. And you're living in confidence and you're in victory right at that moment. 
And then you get to work and you get out of your car. <laughs> and by the time your first coffee break comes around, you've already messed up. Peter didn't have enough conviction for Christ to make it through the night. I don't think any real believer wants to fail the Lord. I think failing the Lord Jesus is the last thing any real Christian wants to do. In the Garden of Gethsemane, earlier that same night, the Lord told his disciples, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, verse 41. But Peter said, not so to conviction. Thirdly, turn, if you will, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. John 13, and we're going to read verses 5 through 8. John 13, verses 5 to 8. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Thirdly, Peter said, Not so to cleansing. Not so to cleansing. Some denominations make foot washing an actual ordinance in the New Testament, along with water baptism and the Lord's Supper. We used to have foot washing services once a year here in our church. I was a boy growing up as a, as a way of fellowship, as a way of believers being closer together. And you, it causes you to be a little uh, humble in front of the brethren and it was a real blessing for my brother and my sister and I growing up under that. It wasn't taught as or preached as some sort of an ordinance, but it was a practice we did. Uh, there's, it'd be hard to find enough scripture to make it a New Testament ordinance. But it was a blessing. And the washing of the disciples' feet was a great example of humility for the Christian. On Christ's part, rather. And he had told them that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. So they were to learn from that example about humility one to the other. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another, he said earlier. Devotionally, it teaches a, a believer that unless Christ washes you your sins from your soul, Nothing you can do will ever wash away your sins. Only Christ can wash them. Only the blood of Christ and faith in the blood of Christ can wash away the sins in your soul. Water baptism can't wash away the sin that's still in your heart. Having your name on a membership role in a church or a denomination doesn't mean your name's recorded in heaven. You can have a whole lot of religion and not have anything real. But if you don't let him do the washing... You ain't going to get washed, my friend. Christ uh, told Simon Peter, you don't know what I'm doing now, but afterwards you're going to know what, I'm, what this is all about. In effect, that's what those words meant. So right at that time, Peter said, not so to cleansing. Lastly, let's go back to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And uh, let me start reading again at verse 13. And we'll go down through verse 16. Acts uh, 10, verses 13 through 16. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have not never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. God was getting ready to reveal one of the great mysteries of the New Testament to, the new, to Simon Peter, that both Jews and Gentiles could be accepted by God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, but before he did, Peter said, not so to cooperation. Not so to cooperation. He had no love for the Gentiles. He certainly wouldn't wash their feet if that came to that. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, eat their food either. They had strict dietary rules given in the book of Leviticus about kosher and uh, non-kosher food, things they could eat. When he says, earlier we read uh, all manner of beast and creeping things, that would have been reptiles, things that crawl on their belly. How many of you like crab meat and lobster? <laughs> Do you know something? Those things were forbidden to the Jews, the old... Boy, I'm glad I'm a Gentile under grace. <laughs> I'm glad I was saved under, under grace. How many love bacon? No bacon, no ham, none of that. Nothing that came from a, a pork. But obviously there was a much bigger thing God was up to. The Gentiles were represented in the vision as all kinds of beasts, all kinds of animals, and the Jew, uh, that the Jew was commanded to avoid under the old law. Obviously, there was something greater God was uh, trying to do, beginning to do. And God said, what I've called clean, that call not thou, common. Now, if you and I stop our sermon right there today, it would make Simon Peter look like the most stubborn of all men in the New Testament. Maybe he was the Pope after all. <laughs> um, if you haven't guessed by now, we don't have much love for the papacy here at Bible Baptist Church International. Um, it's our conviction that the uh, Antichrist will off occupy the office of a Catholic Pope one day. The Vatican is religion and politics combined together. It's the smallest state in the world, the smallest country in the world, 100 acres, Vatican City. And the head of that religion represents the largest church in the world and also represents a political country. And uh, nobody with less authority than a Catholic Pope could ever become the Antichrist. That was taught by virtually all the Protestant founders over the centuries that the Pope occupies the office of the Antichrist. Uh, it's my own personal conviction, and I'm still studying it, but uh, Islam will, will probably supply the world with the false prophet. They worship a false prophet already named Muhammad. And those two religions have historically been the most anti-Semitic of all religions, Islam and Catholicism. And if the Great Tribulation is the great, greatest time of persecution, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, then I won't be surprised if a partnership between Islam and Catholicism is formed to create a one-world government. Those, those two religions alone incorporate about two and a half billion people on the earth right now. I think they're calling it Chrislam right now, trying to merge those two religions. But uh, be that as it is, when we speak ill of Catholicism here, it's not because we're trying to be mean, we're just trying to be accurate. But fortunately, the story of Simon Peter doesn't end with these four points I've given you today. When it came to saying not so to the cross of Christ, Peter would come to understand that his death was necessary. Later, Peter would write, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. 
After having said no to conviction and denying Christ, he wrote that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. He told Caiaphas and Annas, the high priests, to their faces, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. The same man who said not so to cleansing would later write, Seeing ye have purified yourselves in obeying the truth through the Spirit under unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter 1, 22. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. In all manner of conversation, there in verse 15 of 1 Peter 1. And the man who said not so to cooperation, later said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God, excuse me, hear that he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Acts 10, verses 35, 34 and 35 later on. So, I'm glad that Simon Peter grew in the grace of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Being that close and having walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years of his public ministry, if he could be restored, then I have every reason to think I could be restored if I fell away and I began to doubt the blessings of God. I began to doubt the promises of God. I began to doubt what I read in his word or ask questions of whether that could actually be so, that could actually be true. Being a Bible believer means you approach this book believing that every single word in it is there by the direct will and the providence of God. And now it's God's job to teach it to you. Your job is to read it, believe it, and be faithful to it. Don't go into it as a approach it as a skeptic and a critic trying to find mistakes in the word of God if it's the word of God then by definition there aren't any mistakes in it don't ever believe some jerk who says this is the word of God and then he tells you now the Greek word should say this or actually the Hebrew word meant that or the other or a better translation should be this he doesn't believe it's the word of God to start with he can hold it up and say whatever he wants but if he presumes to correct one thing in it then he doesn't believe it's a perfect Bible. Amen. If there's even one mistake, then there's no perfect Bible around. And thank God that through time and grace and patience and uh, faithfulness to God's book, God will be faithful to me. He'll be faithful to you. Amen. When you and I stumble and fall and we make mistakes, we make a mess of things and we want to doubt God's work, that God doesn't know enough about how to handle our problems or deal with our difficulties and troubles. God's much smarter than you and I are. And uh, I, I often pray that God, when we're praying and taking requests on Wednesday nights, the Lord knows more about our problems than we know about our problems. And he knows how to solve them. He knows how to answer them. But Peter, the not-so-apostle, turned out to be uh, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, the Bible says. That's the kind of apostle he became. And uh, I want to become that kind of uh, follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.